Welcome to the webinar tonight. I kind of feel even though we're all online that it, we uh, deserve, we should give special props to everybody who came because it's we've got like a foot of snow in Michigan and it kind of just feels like it takes a lot of energy to do anything um, even though we're just on our computers, right? Yeah. Um, so There's we've got, a lot of snow. You can, you can see a video of Carrie and me and then you should be able to see Ryan, I think. Um, Ryan was chatting some instructions at the top there on how to get the actual videos to show up. Um, the main uh, gist of what we're doing, though, is going to be uh, here, though, uh, in, the, uh, in the actual slides. We're, we only have 10 uh, slides to go through, and we're just going to talk on each one um, a little bit about some of the, uh, some of the items that we're, that we're looking at today. Um, so uh, it, it's it's let's talk money and um, you know we're um, uh, we're going to go through uh, a bunch of things um, but really it, I'm not sure how much of it's going to be steps and how much of it's just going to be a whole bunch of really cool advice that we've uh, that we've mm -hmm. got here. I know we've got a lot of people who maybe don't have careers or haven't started careers that are exactly like ours. So the information is going to pertain uh, pretty widely to a number of different things. Uh, so my name is Matt. If you don't know me or recognize me from any of our weird promo photos, uh, I'm our saxophonist and Carrie, our uh, clarinetist, hey. is with me. Uh, Carrie Landry, uh, since we got married uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and we might have an assist today from um, Oscar. The, oh, you're, you're going to force this one. Okay. I am. Uh, from Oscar, the Shetland Sheepdog, yes. um, who I think you can see. Uh, we shouldn't hear from him unless unless anybody outside decides to close any car doors loudly then we'll then he'll he'll speak um so um uh carrie i know that we've been uh doing this kind of thing um in person right at colleges and things for a while right? yeah so really we developed this thing called acropolis works a couple years ago and the basic idea is that it's a series of entrepreneurial workshops and lectures that we've been doing at colleges and universities all around the country and this past year in fact we did a total of 14 i think and we've gotten a lot of interest and feedback from students just like you that they wanted this information more readily available so we decided to do uh, this webinar series and this is our first one actually yeah we figured for the first one we might as well just talk about money right <laughs> we're gonna do some other ones in the future about more specific topics maybe marketing or maybe digital media social media or maybe just how to do recordings, all sorts of different kinds of things. But we figured we'd go hard right with the money uh, right away. So if you don't know um, about Acropolis um, and you're not too familiar with us uh, and how what, what our organization is like and how we're set up today, um, I'm the executive director of Acropolis and of our 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Nonprofit. Carrie is uh, the director of marketing and uh, development, basically. And then the other three members, you got Ryan here, and then Andrew and Tim, um, of course, um, are artistic co-directors, and they share um, administrative roles in the organization as well. Um, we met in 2009, the five of us, at the University of Michigan. Um, at that time, we stumbled across this thing called the Reed Quintet. Um, and uh, since then, we've performed around the country and abroad, um, and we've kept the same five members together the whole time, which is, which is kind of rare in in chamber music. In addition to performing Reed Quintet music and arrangements, we sell uh, CDs, of course. We have a Reed Quintet publishing catalog of sheet music. Um, we have an online web premiere series of different works. Uh, and we, of course, do educational outreach as well for communities and for schools. Um, and uh, as a nonprofit, we're funded by uh, individual donors. We're in the middle of our fundraising campaign right now for the end of the year, which I'm sure you see on our, our Facebook wall. And then we're funded by a couple of grant uh, supporters as well for our different community projects. Um, so we give about 40 or so like actual recitals a year and then we also do uh, about 40 or 50 of those kind of educational or community different kinds of performances like I mentioned. Um, but at our heart we're a business and we've really always thought of ourselves uh, as a business and that's kind of what today is to start getting you to think uh, that way. Like many artists uh, like you who are on the cusp of a music career or maybe just started one or just thinking about it and you have an idea of a product or service or a comp some kind of company related to the arts or to music that you want to have um, and you want to create a niche for yourself in that. Um, a lot of people in, in our sphere can be afraid to think of themselves as a business owner or as an entrepreneur. Uh, we want to encourage you to think about money as it pertains to your art and that's basically what we're, what we're doing today. Um, how, to, how to get it, how to keep it, 
uh, and how to grow it, uh, regardless of, of what you do. All right, so before we dive into our actual 10 steps, we have a couple of little housekeeping items that you can think about throughout this 40-minute uh, webinar. The first one is that Ryan Reynolds, our bassoonist, should be in the chat window right now. You should be able to see his video. And while Matt and I are going to be going through these 10 steps, Ryan is going to be talking with all of you, answering any questions that you have, and basically helping you along throughout this whole process. So we do want to encourage you to ask questions in that chat window. Uh, that's where Ryan's going to be answering them, and we're also going to do about a 10 or so minute uh, Q&A session at the end. We're going to pop over to Facebook Live as well and answer all of your questions about this topic. Um, so we're here in video form as well, as you should be able to see us by now, so you can hopefully both see the screen and see the video. And again, if you have questions, direct it to Ryan. And so the presentation is gonna be about 40 minutes long. We're gonna go through the 10 steps and then save some time at the end to answer all of your questions. Um, and don't worry about taking really copious notes during this whole thing because we are going to pop up the whole webinar, the recording, the slides, everything up on our website after this. So you can go to our Acropolis Works page and that where you can find everything, all the resources pertaining to what you're hearing and what you're attending right now. And again, just go to the chat if you have any issues, especially with the audio or video, and we'll be able to and help send you out. A, and send a, the, any questions to, you have a choice, send to everybody or send to the host. And send them to everybody so that you know we can all kind of see what questions are being asked. And Ryan only has access to see them if, um, if you do send it to everybody. And he's going to kind of moderate the, uh, the Q&A at the end. Yes. Um, and when we do go over to the Facebook Live, we're going to keep this webinar up, right? So oh, you yeah. don't have to go to Facebook Live to see the Q&A. You just, just hang right here. Cool. Are we ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So step number one is set realistic expectations. So first, approach any business endeavor with realistic expectations or goals. As you can see by this really heartwarming stat we've cited at the beginning, there's a good chance that your idea, my idea, any idea probably won't pan out in the first year. And I think there's another similar statistic about marriages not working out. <laughs> um, I, I'm not worried about that, but no. we... Um, no, we have the company and the marriage. Work, yeah. so, right. So it doesn't wait. If... If businesses and companies both fit, isn't, isn't that like 25% yeah. chance that like something is right? I okay. know, not, anyway. not good odds. Anyway, anyway uh, so we don't say set realistic expectations so that if you do, you'll fail. Uh, you have to see it coming. So we say that you have to create parameters for your success in the first year that are actually achievable. So if you have realistic goals that you can achieve within your first year, then you have realistic expectations. And this really shouldn't be based on money, probably within the first year. Um, for Acropolis in our first year, we wanted to play a few concerts. We wanted to commission a student composer and develop and get better as musicians, basically. Right. And that's about what we did, and that's what it was. And frankly, at the end of the day, after the first year, we just wanted to stay together. And that's a pretty big issue um, in chamber music today. And after we got through the first year achieving all that, that really wasn't revolving around money, we felt really great. And we're going to talk a bit about the product or the service that you offer and why that needs to be at the core of what you really do. But if in the beginning you stay focused on building a really strong identity that's based around a product, those really realistic expectations or your service, that is good truly of any quality truly that the market has. Then realistic expectations will help you stay firmly rooted and firmly on the ground. So another thing that the last point here says is that it takes time. So you really shouldn't expect your company, your business, your venture to take off within that first year, even within the first couple years. So that's really part of having realistic expectations. So if you're expecting that, you probably won't fail. And that's how you get to be part of the 50% that actually succeed after the first year. Um, so the kind of thing that we didn't, we told ourselves was don't quit your day job, right? And in fact, uh, many of the members of Acropolis yeah. still all have yeah. day jobs. Ha we, we haven't quit our day jobs to this, to this point. Right. Yeah, right, right. Um, so it's, um, I think after, maybe after you've made it for the, through the first year, or you've kind of started to understand that so much of, of having that initial success is creating something that that can be successful in the first year um, it's time to start thinking about uh, money as it pertains to your company 
um, or whatever that is, your idea, your product, um, your organization, your vision. Um, and that can be, you know, thinking about that money can be a scary thing. Uh, your company's money, though, and this is this is really important, and it took us a little bit of time to figure this out, and it still kind of troubles me, especially to think about with people who um, may they're, they're themselves might be their company, right? Like I'm a soloist, or I, I teach private lessons, like I don't have other people with me, it's all just me. But your company's money, you know, is not yours, and the other way around, right? So anything you spend on the company um, that, you know, comes out of your personal wallet, um, and the company probably isn't making you know anything for you know for you yet, right? Um, so in our first three years, Acropolis uh, didn't make any money off of this business venture, right? Nope. <laughs> and it, it helped that at the beginning we were in college, but we didn't take a dime from the company. Um, after year one, I'd say we actually started getting paid, but it was the company that was getting paid. Okay, so that was Acropolis's money; it wasn't us, um, and that was all money that we were getting from giving free concerts. Um, and just basically asking for donations or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we created the Acropa pot, uh, Acropa anything really. That's how how yep. we talk. Um, but the the Acropa pot, which was um, uh, basically a, a pot of money that we could uh, we could put anything. It could be our personal money, but then all the Acropolis money would go in there as well to spend on Acropolis stuff. So I kept all of this Acropa pot in my bank account. Um, and, uh, and I kept a ledger of what was my money and what was Acropolis's money. And I, I swear I didn't spend any of, of uh -huh. Acropolis's money. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we began to, you know, to think of Acropolis as a business once we separated Acropolis's money from our own. So if your company is you and it's, and it's just you and you, you freelance or you gig or whatever, um, think about your, your company as a company. So yeah, I'm a performer, but you, the performer, private teacher, etc., is not you, the human, right? So the human has to eat and sleep and pay for groceries and buy toilet paper and all sorts of stuff like that. But you, the company, is a completely different thing. It has to be branded and sold and marketed and things like that. So I hope you, you see the difference there. And so those two things require different thought processes and different and different uh, kinds of money. Um, so the company, you know, you is, is not the company, right, the person. Mm -hmm. So um, we suggest starting by actually opening an actual bank account, even if it's just um, and it would be dedicated to your company, even if it's just a savings account um, through your current bank and that where you keep only money for the company, right? Um, so it could be an LLC if you wanted to actually create a business entity right away. That costs like 40 bucks. You just have to make sure you file the taxes for it, which, you know, isn't really that difficult to do um, at the end of the year. Um, but, you know, not too much to actually have an entity there for it, right? Uh, then you can actually have the company can have its own checkbook, debit card, I don't recommend credit cards because that, that just gets into a whole different thing. Use cash, right? <laughs> um, so uh, then um, I would, at that point, start to actually track the income and expenses that are, um, your company is incurring. Again, not you, but anything related to your actual business. Um, so uh, the, the, the biggest reason we want to do this is you, as you may know, and I hope you do, uh, anything related to how your company makes you money can be deducted from your taxes at the end of the year. And then you also want to kind of start tracking these income and expenses because uh, later on, and we're going to talk about a budget pretty soon, um, you'll actually want to know what actually costs you money and what makes you money, right? And so mm -hmm. the, the, the sooner you start to track these income expenses, uh, the better. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Carrie. Uh, I'm a money person in the group, so I do that kind of stuff. So. All right. <laughs> so you're starting to get your money organized. You're in the 50% of awesome people and awesome companies that didn't fail within that first year. So it's probably time to do a check on your biggest offering, which is what we like to call your MVP or your most valuable product. We want you to think about the most core and key offering, the biggest thing that you have that's a part of you, the thing you sell that is at the core of what you do and why you do it. So first off, you have to ask yourself, do I have a good product? And is it based on something that won't change at the end of the day or five, 10 years down the road? So an example that we like to give is Amazon. Their MVP isn't Cards Against Humanity uh, because when you search top sellers, that's what you see. And it isn't that weird Alexa speaker that you can talk to in the corner that they're trying to get you to buy before Christmas. Amazon- That thing is weird. Yeah, I, oh, and then they made the mini one. Um, Amazon's MVP is convenience and service because right. people will always pay a lot of money for good service and the convenience of having that awesome stuff show up right at your door. 
So right now, Amazon, that comes in a form of their shipping, but they could totally change that in the years to come and still have that identity as their MVP. So right now, they're experimenting with right grocery store fronts and also delivery weird, stations but I'm sure it'll work. and like having weird PO boxes. So they're doing a lot of new things. Yeah, right, right. right. Well, and, and like, you know, for us, we actually think about companies like Google and Amazon and, and, and such when we're actually thinking about, you know, building our company, even though we have nothing in common. You're right. Right. But 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 at the same time we have like everything in common in terms of how we're how yeah. we're building audiences and how we're getting people to try to trust in what our core identity is. So yeah. yeah. So 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 maybe the Alexa thing is weird, but like we still like you know identify. You can it, learn so. from it for sure. <laughs> and so after that you have to ask yourself, what does my product affect? And what kind of impact does it have? And that's really important in music and the arts especially. If you have an impact, people will come and people will support it at the end of the day. So for Acropolis, our MVP, or as we like to call it, you know, our secret sauce, our special ingredient, is our performances of reed quintet music. We have lots of other offerings and cool things we do, but everything goes back to that core of performing reed quintet music. That's our MVP. Our music, our art, we find that the art has to be at the center of cultures right now all around the world and all cultures, that's been a part of it forever. So we can see that happening hundreds of years in the history and hundreds of years in the future. So we feel good about keeping that at our core, even though we could change many other things. We could have our weird Alexa speaker, you know, in 10 years right. to come. Right. And, um, <laughs> and if you do have different kinds of offerings, this is the last point here, make sure you know how your MVP can water and grow and all the other adjacent offerings and how the other adjacent offerings can water and grow your MVP, so vice versa. So for Acropolis, we have our sheet music catalog, the Acropolis collection, which doesn't really generate a whole a lot of money for us but we find it really legitimizes and solidifies our music that we perform so it waters our mvp it makes our mvp stronger and more powerful and it also helps spread our music through the reed quintet idiom around the country so they all help each other balance each other out right yeah yeah totally exactly um so um you know at, at this point um you know we also i mean we have other uh, adjacent adjacencies as well right in addition yeah. to our mvp you know we also sell cds right and 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 i that's that's a perfect example of something where you might think of a music group and you might think of what you do or what you want to do um as having um what you might consider your more obvious most valuable product and and then maybe that's wrong maybe it's maybe actually rethinking about um thinking about what won't change in the marketplace over a long period of time will shift what you consider your most valuable product. Um, so for us, we sell CDs, for instance, and we kind of knew from the beginning that we were never going to sell, you know, a ton of CDs. But CDs are, are, are a perfect example, and we have our, our third one coming out that we just spent tons of money on that we're not going to make back. It's just a fact. Like no matter, even if we sold all of them at the mm -hmm. price we want to sell them at, uh, we're probably not going to. But um, our discography is basically a representation and an edification of our most valuable product right so that yeah. becomes a really really valuable thing for us to have so i'm sure uh, in your line of, of of artistic work whatever it is you have a similar uh kind of way that you can justify some of these adjacent products that you have um so okay so you've you've at this point got a uh, better idea maybe of of how to define what your most valuable <laughs> product uh, or service or idea is uh maybe you figured it out but if you don't hopefully that that kind of helps you out um, so you want to start thinking about the people, um, geez, the people who are going to kind of help you help you get there and help move that product forward. Um, so, and when we're talking about people, um, it's we're really not talking about your friends, coworkers, teachers, etc. So those are people in your life or wherever they are that are really really important. But it's time to start kind of shifting and thinking about people as actual customers, whoever they are. So we think of our people when we say, like, who are our people? We've got those people as well. We've got our board of directors, uh, all of our parents, all five of us, the 10 of the most supportive, you know, love, you know, whatever people you could you could ever think of. Right. Um, but our people really we start to think of as our fans, our supporters and ultimately people who are going to be buying our product, um, all of you. So we're here. You're our people now. So you came out on this snowy night Woo. to your computer uh, to to you know to, to look at this webinar, and so we're cultivating you, right? And so if you know, and another another way to think of it is is uh, like a chef um, who they share uh, you know a lot of deep 
secrets about what they do, right? But they're not uh, worried about that because the best ones or how we perceive the, the best ones is uh, based on the ones who are actually out there selling your secrets and telling me how to do it, yeah. right? So that's kind of basically what the whole purpose of these different kinds of offerings that we have is. Um, so that's how we think of we think of you when we think of our people. So um, the people who you currently reach with your uh, vision, idea, product offering, whatever it is. Um, they could be people who came to a concert, um, people on your email list, uh, people who wrote you an email or a note, people who follow you online. So start asking yourself, why did they come to the concert? Uh, what can, else can I learn about them? Why did they buy my product? Why are they interested in my service? Uh, listen to them. You know, Do they enjoy your most valuable product? Um, and get to know them much more deeply. So then you can kind of compare those people, uh, the people who are your, your current people, uh, to the people you'd like to reach. So, for example, if you were... Uh, we use the baby carriage analogy a lot. If you're, I don't know, because everybody's got babies, right? Everybody needs a baby carriage. So if you're selling baby carriages, uh, your people at this point are probably mothers, right? Or at least that's the first thing that you think. Uh, but you can also sell uh, baby carriages to dads and uncles mm -hmm. and grandparents and all those people as well. But they're different customers and they're different people. And they're going to be talked to differently and you're going to learn different things from them about what they want in, in baby carriages, if, if, especially if it's just to buy it for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? So this is the secondary list of people that um, you're going to end up thinking as your, your total list of, of potential customers. So your people, and uh, as soon as you kind of start to shift of thinking of your people this way, really are going to make your company make or break it and your investment in them um they you know they're your people for a reason they're they're really critical to your success and if you don't grow that list of people uh you you really don't have any chance of of growing of growing profits so you have to be really really proactive not only about learning from whoever those people are but um also like proactive about finding them and cultivating them right um you can't uh, you know grow the list just to grow the list grow the list of real people who are genuinely interested in what you're doing uh, rather than just you know names and email addresses and such um, so while uh, you're kind of focusing on 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 building your people um, we uh, kind of wanted to start uh, throwing out some items to make sure you knew how to save money so especially at the beginning uh, having healthy finances from the beginning I think is really important yeah so beginning to think immediately about what do you really need um, one of the big challenges at the beginning of any company is uh, how do I get a lot of stuff done without a lot of people and uh, without knowing a lot or without knowing how to run a company at the end of the day or without knowing anything about advertising, finances, how to print things, all that kind of stuff. You, what, what do you really need to know? And the key is really not having a massive to-do list and trying to get all that stuff done but the key is figuring out what you really need to do and how to be really efficient with your time to get it done so the more done um, that someone else is they can have the same money and resources so can you make resources out of resources that's really the question that we're asking so at the beginning of a company you will never have everything you need you need to get the next step and you won't have the money to pay for it probably <laughs> right. um, so uh, start thinking about really what your needs are do you need equipment you know do you need software do you need an instrument do you need print materials do you need actual human services do you need other people to do stuff for you like maybe accounting or a designer yeah. or do you need somebody to record you an audio engineer and um, do you need time you know time for us is one of the biggest things so think about what can I offer someone besides money for their services so you came up with your big list of needs and now you have to figure out how to get those needs actually met so back at the beginning you know we offered uh, people like composers recordings performances uh, spot in our sheet music catalog Beer. anything you know because um, we we didn't know how to actually pay for it yet so that was how we did it at the beginning and um, what kind of resources can you get for free so yeah. you know we envy a lot of the students out there because there are tons of free resources at um, high schools colleges universities um, there are also free resources at community centers, co-ops, or these little small business incubators that are popping up all over the place. Uh, they have a ton of free resources that you can take advantage of. And most importantly, um, we, we really did this early on. What you 
you know, what you can learn to do yourself. Is it a skill? Is it a trade? Is it a software program that you can try and figure out for yourself? So at the beginning, when we started out, we really invested in trying to figure out, you know, could we learn design? Could we learn how to engineer audio, you know? Uh, could we take maybe some classes and figure out how to do our own accounting? You know, could we talk to a CPA or something like that and figure it out? Um, could we figure out how to write our own grants? You know, what books or what people did we need to talk to in order to feel like we were competent in that area? How do we do our own payroll? You know, how, how to cut videos yeah. and, and all that. I mean, we really sat down and thought about our needs. And instead of going to other people for them, we tried to meet them ourselves at the at yeah. the beginning. Well, and, and ultimately, you know, it was a question of in that first year, those first couple of years, you're never going to get everything done. But if you can get more done than the next business can in the same amount of time yeah. uh, with less money, then you're going to be off to a better start and your, your business is going to have a better core when it's time to really start investing. Uh, and you have to really st actually start paying for things, yeah. right? And which is which is kind of where we're going uh, with the with the next slide here. Yeah, yeah. So um, eventually, uh, and y you know, you really do ha have to actually even early on would really encourage you to actually start listing these needs, putting line items to them, uh, and creating an actual budget, right? So um, as you're uh, thanks, Oscar. As you're starting to document your uh, your needs, uh, you know, go ahead and begin, you know, actually making your first budget. Um, so I'm not here gonna gonna tell you how to budget, or you know, you can Google, you know, how to create one. Essentially, just a you know, uh, all your expenses over here, your income over here, and then you know, see at the end if my income is uh, more than my expenses, I have a profit. If not, I have a loss. That's you know, you can have a budget for a specific project, or you can have it for the whole company for an amount of time. You know, most companies budget on a yearly, on a fiscal yearly basis, right? Um, so uh, without a budget, you know, essentially you're not going to understand the scope of your company. So how much more will I have to ultimately spend in order to get? How much more do I need to save, right? All these things can be quantified with a budget. Um, how much do I need to invest, right? And we're going to talk about that in just a sec. So with a budget, um, you'll actually be able to see if your company will eventually shape into being profitable, right? Um, so you need to kind of start thinking now about, you know, uh, the most valuable product, the service that you're offering, the company itself, and if it's ultimately going to be able to be monetized, right? And the budget's really the only way you're going to be able to do that. So it's the, you know, it's the guts, essentially, of the of the company. It's not the, the pretty stuff, but you're certainly not going to survive very long uh, without it. It's not really pretty or fun, but it's 100% it's necessary for any business. And again, a lot of people, and I'll go back to, you know, since I, we probably have a few uh, soloists or freelancers or people making a solo career somehow on your own in, in music, you know, in the webinar audience, um, you know, it's, it's important to say again that, you know, e even if it's just you, these financial steps are really, really important to take early on in thinking of you, the company, rather than you, the, the, the human. Um, so I think in our first three years, in fact, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure we didn't even have a budget, did we? Nope. You know, I, I don't, uh, it was, it, we were just kind of like, uh, well, well, we didn't have a whole lot of, you know, it was, it was, it was very simple. It was put all the money into the Acropa pot and then just like, if we have to buy something, then we had some way to, to spend it, right? Um, but we were thinking the other day, you know, wh what our budget is for this coming fiscal year, which for us starts on July 1st. So we're planning out our fiscal year budget July 1, 2017 to June 30, 2018. And it's very lofty, and we have everybody's salaries in there. And we're not, we don't quite have what we have yet. We don't quite have everything set up for all the revenue we need for that year yet, right? But it's pushing us to get to that point, finding out exactly what we need to have and what we need to save in order to get to that point. But in the first three years, we didn't have that. But I'm, we're sitting here wondering, like, what if we did? Like, even, yeah. if, it, we, even if it was very modest, <laughs> had, had we tried? <laughs> wouldn't, if we had, wouldn't we have begun that fourth year, having pushed ourselves, you know, further to make more progress, having being able to see everything financially? And then where would we be, you know, in year eight now if that had happened? So just a little, just a little, you know, advice there, I, I'd say. So <laughs> yeah, I think it's, you know, it's great to be a little ambitious with your budget because at the end of the day, it just pushes you to work towards that goal a little bit more. So step seven is diversify your products. And this is a, a pretty simple concept, but sometimes it's really a little bit more difficult to implement than you would think. So you want to stretch yourself a little bit in terms of what you expect to be making. And you'll probably feel better about what you're budgeting in your income column once you actually do this step. So if you diversify your products and you give yourself more revenue opportunities and more channels 
to find more of your people at the end of the day. So our MVP, we said, was the concert experience of the Reed Quintet. But products that enhance our MVP are include our webinar series, for instance, our web premiere series, uh, and the web premiere series is which where we release the videos online of new and arranged read quintet music. And so these things really talk to each other and really enhance our MVP. So most importantly, the web premiere videos, they actually open up a channel for us so we can find new people and engage with these new people. So every product that we have has a different person and a different channel. And so that's how you grow the branches of your tree essentially and help water the roots of your MVP. So once the channel collects the person, we can decide the best course to move them up and down the ladder. So being a concert goer or a donor or someone who purchases a CD, etc., we can figure out where they need to go next, where they've been, and you know how we can move them through the process. So think about your MVP as a trunk of a tree, as your company, and there are maybe five, ten, maybe fewer, maybe more um, branches going up that can collect sunlight and rain and all those goodies. And which are the customers that will eventually engage and appreciate your core identity as a company? So diversifying and at the end of the day is generating different but related products. Branches. That yeah, <laughs> and they'll help water your tree and keep your company healthier. That's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so so yeah, so thinking about them as as actually connected to the to the core product rather than uh, you know think like you know living in their own zones or anything like yeah. that. Which is I think a, 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 how a lot of people end up thinking about these things. Like, what else can I sell? It's like you're always selling yeah. the MVP you're at the always end of the selling day, the right? That's the that's the the trick there so um so you know at some point um it's going to come down to real money and in acropolis i mean i'd say you probably invested <laughs> on the order of 50 to a hundred thousand dollars i'd say you know over you know when you add up uh traveling to to competitions and making our first three cds and um all sorts of gosh all, all, all sorts of you know equipment and instruments and things that we've and travel and etc that we've that we've had to uh had to forgo to kind of get where we are here um, so, you know, you've, you've got your product, you've got your kind of people in order, um, you've got a, a, you know, a budget, uh, so, you know, you've got products, right? Um, but you're going to have to start putting real money, you know, probably your own, maybe, you know, to get to the next level. So um, investing has a lot of connotations along with it, and a lot of them, you know, aren't always that great, right? They involve risk, they involve like, you know, uh, is it a safe investment? Am I going to get, you know, my money back, all these kinds of things. But we want you to encourage you. Uh, to you know, take your to, to kind of take your savings, which for you know uh, was Acropolis was that that crop of pot, um, and actually just just think wisely about about what you do with it, which will create an instance in which you'll be safe and you'll you'll lower the risk essentially of um, of what your investment's going to be. So right now there's you know this sort of worrying trend um, about there uh, you know out there about kind of encouraging people in the, in the in the small business or the incubator or the startup space to fail like it's kind of okay go out there have an idea see what happens yada yada and i think that's okay for ideas and and maybe it's okay um might be okay if you're in your second year of college or something and you want to kind of come up with an idea if you're out there and you're you're trying to make bread and get paid and pay the bills right failing probably isn't the, the greatest idea um and what we mean by that is essentially there are other people out there who are going to fail for you. There are other ideas out there that you can see. There are people out there who will let you know what seems to be um, the right investment. Uh, there are people out there who will make the mistakes for you, right? Yes. <laughs> so you don't. So essentially, so you don't have to. All of this will help you mitigate the risk of putting money into something uh, that isn't fully fleshed fleshed out. You know. So um, surround yourself with with people in your field who have done what you've done um, and make calculated decisions. You know, rather than um, then kind of moving moving forward in, in, in a more uncertain uh, manner about where the money might go. So an investment uh, really is you should have a you know a, a very very high likelihood of having a return for you. Yeah. Um, and 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 find those companies similar to you so you can figure out what works before you go ahead and do it. Absolutely. Right. 
All right, so we're nearing the end here. Let's talk about step nine, which is forecasting ahead. So this is really similar to the previous step of investing in your future, uh, but we want to encourage you to actually forecast your future. So don't guess at your future, forecast it, make it happen. So determine what it will be essentially. And when we were just in our second or third year, we were thinking about what we would like to look like in year eight, and we pretty much look like what we said. So you well, know, not like physically. Like, y yeah, you like know. the company looks like. Right? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty much bang. I on didn't to turn what out as well as I thought I you would. You still have the beard. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's thicker. Right? It's worth it. <laughs> um, so if you don't forecast your financial growth in revenue, it probably is not going to happen. No, that's, it seems weird, but that's if, if, it, if you don't really, write yeah. it out and forecast it, it's very likely that it's not going to happen. Yeah. Totally agree. So yeah. back at step six, when we were talking about budgeting, use your budget and start to look at a year over year as soon as you have one. So basically what that means is don't just budget for your pro project at the beginning, but try and come up with a year to date budget for everything you're doing in a year and then do one for the next year, the following year and see how much they match up, see where the growth is happening and see where you can really project that growth to happen in those same columns, you know, the next year out, three years out and so on and so forth. And this, this is because this is one of the most powerful tools we found in determining if our forecast happened and how far we've come in a year and also where our pitfalls are. So of course, if you actually do this financial forecasting, you can keep it really realistic, but that's why you have to think all the way back to the first step. So the last thing you want to have is to have an unrealistic vision of dollars that you're going to be making. So in year two, you don't want to say, I'm going to make a million dollars um, from concerts and performances, and it's going to happen just because I write it down. So at the end, think back to the first step about setting realistic expectations. And what you can reasonably expect to accomplish at the end of the day. And then the real trick about forecasting is you actually have to go for it and able to make it happen. So that's the real key. Yeah, yeah, it's, it seems a little bit, um, a little bit, I guess, uh, you know, cheap of a, of, a, of a piece of advice to just say that, you know, <laughs> uh, money will, will kind of get there or be there if you forecast it, right? Yeah. But there are, there are so many ways, and especially in the artistic, you know, universe, you, you, you have a product, you have something that goes out there and makes a difference, you get it out there, you have people who, who will give you money to do it. You know, we, we know what kind of world we're living in, we know how important, you know, the arts are, but it's up to you. No one is gonna, people will come along and support you, but no one will help you forecast where you're going or plan it out or see it and then tell you if you did it and if you didn't, what more you need to do. That's all gotta be on you. No no one's gonna be handing over those kinds of, <laughs> right. those kinds of ideas. They'll, they'll help you, but they're not gonna do that. Right. And so. once you actually sit down and do your one year, three year forecast, you're going to see where the areas are that you need to invest not only money, but your time. You're going to see where are the biggest avenues of growth that I can see happening over the next several years. And that's what I need to be putting my time and my effort into growing and expanding into watering your tree and your branches to make it actually happen. Wow, are we at step 10? Let's do it. Step 10. So this is the last and final step, and this is kind of just is this, a... Is this kind of where, kind of where we are now, I'd say? Yeah, I'd say I mean, I feel is... like this is kind of the where we kind of pick up with where our journey is as, yeah. a, as, a, as a group. Yeah. So this is um, this is maybe, maybe thinking about it from a bigger mindset, and this is money is a moving target. So to wrap things up for our webinar, we really wanted to encourage you to think about the following three things a bit more pretty much every day. And the first one is that learning more means earning more. So we still try and hold ourselves to this each and every day in that the more knowledge we can soak in about business, about finances, about grant writing, about whatever it is that we're putting our time and effort into, at the end of the day, the more knowledge we take in, that's gonna directly correlate into us earning more at the end of the day. So it's something that, you know, you can't think of yourself as stagnant ever or that you made it to your plateau and that you don't need to invest more resources into growing your knowledge. So think about that when you're trying to move your company forward. And even if you're feeling really comfortable with your company, it's something that you have to do to kind of get up and take yourself to the next level. 
And the second one is something that we really, you know, we were especially bad at at the beginning uh, was investing in the actual process just as much as the ideas. We were really good at investing in our ideas and trying to make actual things, but somehow the process, the little minutia of the day-to-day stuff can really clog you up and really slow you down and make you uh, really inefficient. So investing in maybe a software, a new printer, you know, whatever it is that's going to make your process, your day-to-day work that much easier, that's going to really, really help you at the end of the day. And the the final thing, you want to do the final thing? Yeah, well, Carrie's going to get the, um, Ryan's going to send over uh, questions for us and um, Carrie's going to get the, the, the little Q and a for Facebook set up. Um, yeah, the, 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 the last point, you know, <laughs> it's like falling down while falling up. So, so it's like for no, I don't really think for any company, um, it's going to be a simple trajectory this way forward, uh, and upward in terms of, you know, year yearly, uh, or even monthly or <laughs> every two years or whatever, uh, how progress happens in terms of making money. Um, it's going to be, you know, some days you're going to feel really good about it and other days you're going to feel bad. Um, so, you know, it could be a month here where nothing happens and then growth can growth can happen all at once, right? <laughs> so you really, really can't get into, especially the music business, thinking that um, there's going to be some sort of straight line trajectory to uh, being a million dollar uh, company or anything like that. So um, Right, and success is measured a little bit differently rather than that just straight line up. You know, you're going to see these little pitfalls and these little creases as you're trying to get to the end where you need to go so before we um before we go over to our uh hey, before we I go over to our now. questions <laughs> and i think we ryan sent these over to me um we uh i, I wanted to uh, just say thanks again to all you guys for uh, thank you for, yeah for coming out for this um i hope there is um if not some uh poignant advice at least some uh some inspiration here um to kind of to kind of get moving um the more of you that have successful careers or companies or whatever in uh, music or in the arts is I th- better for everybody, right? The, yeah. I think we, we, we really want all of you to go out there and like affect the world through music. Uh, like I said before, um, I think that that only makes makes this a better place to live. So please do that and please follow up with us. Um, I think by this point, you know how to get in touch with us between all the registering and emails and all that stuff. So please send us a Facebook message or send us an email or something like that. You're asking questions here, but we, we do, um, we've had sit down and had coffee with people. We've done a lot more things to help um, younger groups or people who are, who are young in the career part of things or the, you know, the business part of things uh, uh, move forward. So mm-hmm. um, are we uh, are we ready there? We are so ready. All right, do that so we can get this thing going. All right, so just a little heads up, we are going to reintroduce what we have been doing on Facebook Live just in case we have some new followers and new visitors tuning in. So we're going to give a little overview and then we are going to dive into the questions. It looks like we have a good bunch here to talk about in our last 15 20 minutes so hang tight thanks for sticking around here we go all right three two one. Oh. oh no all right i'm just gonna get going oh there it is all right go hey hey thanks for joining us we just finished up with our acropolis works webinar our 10 steps for generating a profitable career within music uh we would we've been on our webinar for the probably the past 40 minutes and now we have a lot of questions to answer from the people that we're attending and please if you have any questions throughout this q a please just type them into the comments and we're going to try and get through as many as we can within the next 15 minutes all right all righty so um uh we are a non-profit organization and Kristen has asked um, how we went about selecting our board of directors. Ooh. So, uh, so you need a board of directors if you're a nonprofit. Um, and uh, basically, what we did when we we, we picked uh, we started we have three people who are on the board right now who are not the five musicians in the quintet. The five musicians in the quintet are also on the board. And I would suggest early in a very small nonprofit that you or the group or whoever are also on the board, right? So of the eight people that are on the board, five of them are us. So we wield power, which is good. Um, so then we picked three people that were experts essentially in small nonprofits. We didn't pick people who had specific expertises in one thing like fundraising, which we will bring on to the board eventually. The board's mm-hmm. only about a year old. Um, and we didn't pick anybody who had a special expertise in like accounting or legal. We have those people as experts to advise us, but we went with three people who were really patient, 
really, <laughs> really love us a lot. One of them's my dad, who's the CEO of the YMCA of Metropolitan Detroit. So he has he's been running nonprofits for thirty years, right? And then uh, the other the other two people are just people who really, 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 really wanted to help us succeed. We didn't want to bring anybody on right away who is in it for more of a transactional or more of a trade because a lot of times right. you'll come on a board because you know you gave money or you'll come on a board because uh, it looks good for you and it looks good for us we didn't do any of that we're kind of getting into the steps of doing that but right away we wanted to go with the people who were in in there to help us whether they were on our board or not that was that mm-hmm. was really key for us so. and and moving forward with trying to figure out new board members that we want to bring on we're trying to think back to the steps of identifying what you really need so we're actually using one of the steps from this webinar and we're trying to figure out what are the skill sets that between the five of us and now the eight of us on the board that we're missing and that we want to have on our board so right now you know we're looking at somebody for fundraising and development because that's a skill that we want to try and develop more ourselves so that's how we're thinking about moving our board forward essentially all right uh Kristen, also to you as the marketing director how do you decide or how do we decide as a group on the brand Ooh. or on our branding essentially yeah and then how do you maintain that how do you kind of okay. you know, make sure that that stays out there so it's really important to try and figure out something that i like to call your brand story or your brand identity and this goes kind of similar to the MVP, the most valuable product that we were talking about, but it's some core values that you have for your business that you want to try and portray through your messaging, through your graphics, through your online presence, through your physical presence, whatever it is. And so some, it's basically like some taglines or some keywords that you want to come up with that will help steer you in a direction. So. For us, one of them is that we wanted to be really colorful and really energetic. So all of our branding and marketing materials are very vibrant, um, a little bit more fun, a little bit lighthearted. We have one. Yeah. Here's a piece. Eh. Hey. Hey. Um, Not any good. And so a little bit more whimsical at the end of the day. And so... Oh, here's an envelope. Here we go. Yay. So these are actually the colors, right? Those are the brands. Yeah. The green green, and the you red, can kinda, basically, right? You can kind of see it. Yeah, there you go. Logo, the logo's on there, right? Logo. We don't use the logo for much, but it, it works for letters. And also. so just some building blocks behind... And Jim Fuquay's address. <laughs> ...building your brand story and brand identity is that you, you want to have a palette and basically a family of things that you stick within throughout all the platforms that you use. So we actually are using two of the same colors that we started with eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Eight years ago, at the beginning of Acropolis, I made like a font family and a color tree family of what we were going to use regardless on all of our products and we stuck with that and now we've introduced a new color at the end of the day and now we're you know introducing little things here and there but at the same thing it's that core identity of what your marketing and brand story is so um so uh this is from kim uh, you guys do a lot for yourselves but what do you outsource what do you deliberately not do for yourselves so um, the one thing we outsource, so I take care of our, our, all of our books financially. So all the receipts entering all of the, all the finances, uh, all, every single transaction gets recorded, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And I do all the budgeting, but we have an accountant that's going to look over our 990, our tax form at the end of the year. Yeah. We have an accountant who's going to, um, do a reconciliation every month for us. Uh, and he also helped set up our payroll, so I don't do the payroll. So Acropolis, as a, as a nonprofit organization, we actually have the five people are W two'd, which is <laughs> a, this big giant mess of a step if you want to do it. But I outsource that to QuickBooks, right? So they take care of that. Um, we also uh, had an attorney who yeah. wrote, who helped write our bylaws for us, so we outsource that. Um, and we outsource. At, what, what yeah, at the beginning when we made our first CD, we did a lot of resources ourselves, and then we quickly realized that that was not a good idea. I was going to say, I was going <laughs> to say the CD. Yeah. And so now we definitely outsource a lot of the audio, audio recording audio. that we do. Yeah. Um, we we did want to do that at the beginning, and then we quickly realized that you know a lot like some of the other platforms where we could feel like we were experts or learn the trades a little bit. That was one that we just couldn't. And I remember, and I remember with the audio specifically, it was a very very directed conversation about it's going to cost us X to, 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 to have Matt not do the audio anymore. We'll have someone professionally do it. And how important is the quality of the audio versus yeah. say the quality of the video and not the quality like our playing, but how we're represented. Right. And, you know, ultimately we decided that, you know, that's just something that we can't really compromise on. We need a very, very good representation of 
of how we sound. If we're going to sound great and we're going to rehearse, it needs to be captured well. You right. know, so that we kind of we kind of just went back to our MVP, to our core, and we decided, you know, that that was something there. So um, other other outsourcing things. I mean, there's so many things that we do do. You know, Carrie does all the design and the web and yeah. things like that. I mean, and you know. going back to the things that we do ourselves, a lot of that, it wasn't out of necessity necessarily, but it was out of interest, too, at the end of the day. Um, there were a lot of things that we were interested in taking on our shoulders and that it didn't seem like... A burden to learn the skills or anything like that or to invest in the software so like Ryan for example has invested in um, finale when he does all the engraving and arranging for our sheet music and that was something that we very could easily have outsourced to somebody maybe even for free but it was a skill that you know we considered valuable and he considered valuable too so that we decided to keep it you know so uh, the next question uh, Kim has another question uh, how much if at all does your management affect your financial decisions? So first of all, when we talk about uh, management for us, we're referring to our manage our manager, um, which also kind of has a weird connotation. I think there's an episode of, I can't remember what it is, and somebody gets a manager and the manager's like contorting them and, and, and like making them, you know, do all these crazy things. Cause like, you're like prisoner. Like once you get a manager, you know, you're, you're prisoner to them or whatever, and they can do anything and whatever with all you your money. money. <laughs> right. But that's, that's not really the case. So our manager is essentially a booking agent for mm -hmm. us. And so that, that manager for us is called aerial artists, aerial artists. I didn't say that very clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, and they handle bookings basically. So anybody who wants to book us, they can come directly to us, but we're probably just going to send them to, to aerial artists. Um, they send out all of our publicity materials. They talk to presenters, thousands of presenters a year around the country. They secure the bookings. And then they negotiate the fees. They collect the payment. They collect mm -hmm. their 20%, and then we get our, our 80%. Um, so they do not impact in any way our personal financial decisions. In fact, they don't want to know how much money we have. They don't. The only m money we make that they know about is the money that they pay us mm -hmm. from the 80%, right? Um, we, we act completely independent of them. Really, all that they do is help us get gigs which right. are you know our major revenue source um, but apart from that we do we do what we do independent in fact you know the fact that we became a nonprofit and we raise money and we get grants doesn't matter they book a gig we need to go do it and you know and that's that's good for everybody so um, that's the way it works in, in, in classical music and I think in, in most manager kind of booking agent relationships that that's how it is you know you need to be able to offer to them that you can do what they're asking you when they ask you to do it at any time and in exchange they stay out of your way and they keep you know, booking for you, you know, right. essentially. And the one financial um, impact that they have is that they do get a cut or a commission on each booking that they book for us. So because they did all the legwork of getting us to the stage, to the presenter, to the concert experience, they take a commission on that. So they have a vested interest in us succeeding and we have a vested interest in them succeeding. So it kind of works both ways. Um, so uh, good, some, some time left still. So, a uh, question from TJ, whoever that guy is. That guy. Um, can, can, just kidding, we know TJ. Um, kind of, TJ, you wanted to know a little bit more, uh, you know, d diving directly into uh, the tax and finance concerns with running a nonprofit. Um, so, write offs, you know, what gets deducted, and then with the payroll. Um, so, and then, uh, yeah, you know, like, all right, great. So, um, you know, when it comes to... <laughs> he wants you especially to yes. address the second half of the question that you didn't say. That I didn't say. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to go... Well, actually, we did pay... For the company itself, the nonprofit Acropolis, did pay for priority boarding on uh, some of our flights on our January gigs, um, which is a legitimate write-off. It, it's, it's part of travel expenses, especially when you have instruments and you can justify to the IRS that you need to get on the plane in yes. order to get your instrument on the plane. Um, so... You know, essentially, the nonprofit, um, I, we only use the nonprofit Acropolis to pay for business related expenses. Um, if it is not related to what Acropolis needs in order to make money, Acropolis cannot pay for it. The individuals have to pay for it. Um, there are things that Acropolis does not pay for that it could, but the individuals choose to do that instead, right? But um, travel is one of those, travels is, is one of those slippery slopes. Um, you know, any meal that we have while traveling, we're allowed to write it off, mm -hmm. right? And the key there is just I keep 
I mean, I keep, we've, I mean, we've had probably a thousand transactions this year. Yeah. Every single one of them has a line item that says what it's for and has a receipt attached to it, yeah. right? And so um, we are unable as a nonprofit to include any of those things as expenses and show what our what our um, end of the year profit is that's getting invested, obviously back into the nonprofit, otherwise we're not a nonprofit, um, if we're not able to say what all those things are. So um, we, you know, in general, go pretty cheap on pretty much everything we can. I mean, you know, my, my our, you know, uh, my dad, the CEO, who is our treasurer of our board, makes sure of that. But uh, yes. you can be rest assured, you know, we're, we're not paying for Delta Comfort as, as it was, as it was, you know, we don't, I know the groups that travel and they travel first class, you know. Um, if Acropolis musicians had to pay for all the travel themselves, they might say, hey, I've got some money, I'll book first class. But Acropolis, the company, wants to cut down on on travel expenses as much as possible. So yeah. Acropolis tries to cover and does, in fact, for the most part, cover all the expenses, including meals, including travel, anything related to overhead of the group. That, of course, means we can only pay X for salaries, right? So that, that comes away from the pot that we can pay for salaries. But um, that's essentially kind of how all that works. Um, you know, and when you have a nonprofit, uh, it's a very, very, very serious commitment. Um, you have to, I mean, you're going to get audited. Um, you're going to um, have to file your 990 every year. Uh, if you don't do that three consecutive years, they terminate your nonprofit. Um, and you, you're going to have to start keeping serious books. And it's a very, very serious investment. It isn't something that should, right. be, should be taken lightly in and, any way. And since it is a, you know, a public nonprofit organization, all of your records are actually available publicly. So you can go online um, to GuideStar and you can see, you know, the public records of any nonprofit organization. And when we were, you know, deciding if this is what we wanted to do or not, you know, we went on there and we looked at, you know, what some of our mentors were doing, why they were nonprofits, what they were making. So, you know, everything that we do is actually, you know, made publicly available because we are a nonprofit. Yeah. And, you know, I guess to, to close with uh, making sure I'm directly answering the question, you know, like, like, should I pay for certain things on, on company dime and all that stuff? You know, talk talk to an accountant and make sure you, you you are confident. Like, even if it's for you, right? If you're doing a gig in a thousand miles away and you book your travel yeah. and it helps you make money uh, and it's just you, you can deduct that on your personal tax return, right? Um, if you pay for a $2,000 first class seat, I don't know if 75% or 100% of that is deductible. I know for Acropolis, we're all good because we, we go cheap. Yeah. But I would take that up with an accountant. Uh, if you're in the Detroit area, Matt Tapson, uh, mjtaps at gmail.com, I think that's it, is a great one. And <laughs> tell him I sent you. Some business to him. Right, yeah, Any other questions? Go. So um, why don't we pull, uh, you wanna un unmute Ryan and see if. Let's unmute Ryan. Ryan, do we, or are you unmuted? Ryan, uh, am I missing anything else? No, one more question for you guys. Okay. Uh, do you have examples of how composers have successfully established a brand? Um, for instance, uh, yeah. how, how would that relate to us and, and, and what do we do? Got it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. cool. I think, question. you know, I think, that's a, I think that question is very astute because you're observing and pointing out that composers need a brand. <laughs> so, you know, the composer's brand and the composers that we like and the... So, well, to, to, you know, to Aunt Ryan, to answer your question, how does it relate to us? We can't really play a composer's music who doesn't have a brand because then we're putting something out there that can't sell itself, essentially, right? Yeah. And, and, and you've probably noticed that good composers do have a way of using their music to create almost a musical identity among the kind of stuff that they write. So it seems like you kind of get a sense of what they're going to produce next based on what's coming um, before. Right, and and something that we've kind of gravitated towards, especially when we pick composers to work with, is if they have a strong identity established in their other pieces, and it's something that we can you know, notice when we listen to their other works, then we can say, okay, I know what this composer is about, I know what their values are, I can sense what kind of music they produce. That's something that I wanna happen for the Reed Quintet. So a really good example is when we commissioned John Steinmetz to write the piece uh, Sorrow and Celebration for Reed Quintet and Audience. He'd written um, a wind quintet piece and several other wind works that you know we could, we could see his identity throughout all his platforms and all of his pieces. And it was something that no matter you know which piece it was, we could tell that this was truly John's essence, everything that he was about. And we knew that if he was going to write a piece for Reed Quintet, it was going to be in a similar vein. So essentially, you're not trying to, you know, 
get a piece of music, you're really getting a person at the end of the day. And if that comes across through the music, then not only do um, us as musicians gravitate to it a little bit more, but also audiences do instantly. You know, they can really relate to it. If um, if you go to if you, if you Google Gregory Wanamaker, he's a he's a great uh, composer, and we commissioned him on the CD as well. He put out new photos on his relatively new website. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't, it, I'm sure you know who Gregory Wanamaker is, but I'll just say it again: W A N A M A K E R. Uh, so that's kind of an example of um, uh, of someone kind of using their online presence to brand themselves really well. You'll also find him on Twitter. You'll find him kind of really really active. Um, I think it's for composers, you know, I think it's important to remember if, you know, if the music is of quality, you know, really it will get circulated if it connects, you know, to, to, to you, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. and, and you have a way of, of, of putting it out there as unique to like your artistic vision and like your, yeah. your angle on what's going on. People really get the, you know, what, what, what composition is at the end of the day, right? Is it's like your slice of how you're viewing things through right. music. And so if you just kind of keep that, um, keep that through everything that you do and find a way with your materials, find a way with your online presence, find a way with the way your, 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 you know, your music looks and the way you present it, the way you talk about it is mm -hmm. really, really important. And you know, th then that'll come through, I think. And one other thing, especially for composers, is that a lot of times we've seen it where composers, the process stops when the piece is done and given to the ensemble. But something that we really take pride in and the composers that we work with take pride in is that they're there throughout the whole process. They're there at the premiere. We had all the composers present when we were recording our CD so that they could be producers on it, so they could have their hands in another part of their product. So it's really about how many different places you can touch of what the ensembles that are performing your pieces are and how can you be present and have an active voice just beyond the concert performance of it. And picking an ensemble that fits with your identity as well. Yeah. Right? So don't just have anybody uh, anybody perform it. Like if, you know, you have a, a certain brand and then if you get an ensemble that does as well, you'll get traction out of it and you'll have a, you know, a more representative performance. Yeah. So Cool. Yeah. Did you want to check? Are we getting any? Um... I think Ryan's on there too. He's been... Uh, posting questions from there as well oh okay great great so i'll ask ryan are there are there any other questions ryan i think that's everything awesome uh, if not people are keeping it to themselves okay well great, you great. can always post questions on any of the comments in facebook live and um we just wanted to thank everybody again for attending we have the q a up on our facebook and like we said at the beginning of this webinar we are going to post the whole webinar um the slides all the audio all the video up on our website right after this so just go to our website which is www.acropolis quintet.com and you can go to our Acropolis Works page there and you'll see all of these goodies from this whole session. Yep. Anything else? Acropolis Quintet at gmail.com if you have any email any other questions. questions. So all right, go forth, make music, make music profitable and uh, make the world a better place. But you can't do it if you don't uh, take care of your money and learn how to make it. So I hope we help. So uh, have a good night from snowy Michigan. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.